Well, good afternoon to you. Welcome to our service this afternoon. It's good to have you with us. Just uh, to remind you, you can see we have the communion table uh, laid and we will be having that communion service immediately after uh, the evening service. There will be a couple of minutes if you have to, uh, if you have to leave, please uh, feel free to do so. If you would like to stay, uh, then you are very welcome to do so also. Just again to mention, uh, next Sunday morning after the church uh, morning service, we'll be having lunch uh, here. So again, you're very welcome to stay for that. If you are planning on coming, if you're able to come, please put your name on the notice board outside on the left-hand side there. Just helps in terms of um, sorting out how many numbers of people we might have. If you're able to bring something, then please also just note it on the, uh, on the notice board. Um, but you don't have to bring something, but if you are able, please let us know. Um, and also just to uh, reiterate again that the, uh, the next Women's Even Bible Study is on Monday at 7.30 at the Zugs. So we'll start our worship this evening, um, just reading a few verses from 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel and chapter 22. We're going to read uh, from verse 26. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty, that you may bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness, for by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Let's just come to God in prayer before we uh, commence our worship. Dear Lord and Father, we thank you that we can come to you and we thank you that we can read those words and that we can have faith in those words, that we can trust in those words. Your word is proven. Lord, not just because it is your word and uh, you cannot be in error and you cannot deceive, as it were, but also we have experienced the proof of your promises and your word in our lives. And we thank you for that and we praise you for that. And we pray that as we come to you this evening, that we would remember your mercy, Lord, that we would indeed come to our God who is a lamp to our path, come to our Lord who enlightens us, out of our darkness. Come to our God who gives us the strength to run against the troop or to leap over a wall. Lord, we thank you that you give us everything that we need. And we would pray that as we worship you this evening, that again, you would send your blessing upon us and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's uh, sing our first song, our first hymn, that is 97, number 97, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. Let's uh, stand and sing this when the music starts. <laughs>
our reading this evening is from Judges, Judges chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 7 through to the end of the chapter. This is Judges chapter 3 and reading from verse 7. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathane, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathane eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer of the child, uh, a deliverer for the children of Israel, who delivered them, Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenez, died. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, and went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length, and fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal, and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, keep silence, and all who attended him went out from him. So Ehud Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in under the blade, and the flat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, He is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited until they were embarrassed, and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and there was their master, fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed, and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Shirah. And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, All stout men of valor, not a man, escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, 
and the land had rest for 80 years. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So we're going to sing again. This time uh, we're going to sing a different hymn to what I thought we were going to. But um, <laughs> so, oh no, it is, it's the same one. I've just got the verse, I've got the chorus written down on my sheets. <laughs> so I was looking at the first line thinking, that's not the first line I've got. We will sing this together. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. And that wonderful uh, chorus that we're going to sing, His Mercy is More. So let's stand and sing that together. Before we come to the Lord in prayer, um, as, um, as gently suggested by Chris this morning, um, I'm going to <laughs> just say something about the, uh, the induction of our, our dear friend and brother, uh, John Rhymes at Deeping Baptist Church, which uh, a number of us uh, went up yesterday uh, to join into that joyful and happy time. I think there were 16 of us in total, uh, 14 in a minibus, uh, and two who weren't brave enough to join us in the minibus, but I won't mention who those two were. Um, the service was uh, overseen uh, by Paul Kosciecka. I can't remember where he came from, but we think, we think it might have been Whittlesea. Um, 
There are a number of churches around that area, uh, all Grace Baptist churches, um, and a number of those uh, pastors were involved in the service. Uh, Paul Muldoon uh, was representing Deeping and the officers there, and Nigel Graham from Warboys was preaching. It's interesting because I've heard all these names before, uh, you know, Whittlesey and Deeping and uh, Warboys, but I, I, I confess I've never been to any of those places. Um, but I know a number of people have preached there, including John. So uh, Nigel Graham, uh, as I said, he was, uh, he was preaching and uh, he read from Acts, uh, Acts chapter 11. And I just wanted to read a small part of the, the reading. Um, I'm not going to repeat his sermon, you'll be thankful to know. But um, in Acts chapter 11, uh, part of the reading was as follows. Now, uh, those... Um, Sorry, some, uh, hold on, let me get this right. Yes, here we are. Verse 21 of Acts chapter 11. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. And uh, Nigel said a number of things, but one of the things that he, he spoke about was that phrase, a good man. Uh, and of course, you know, we all, we've all known, we've all known, a lot of us have known John for a long time, and um, we could very, uh, very happily say he is a good man. Um, but that wasn't really the point whether John was a good man or not. You know, there's a lot of talk about good people at the moment, isn't there? You know, the queen was a good person, wasn't she? She was a good monarch. She was a good ruler. She lived a good life. She gave the nation good service. But that wasn't really the point that was being made. And the point that, that Nigel did make, and I thought this was interesting, is his, and he said this quite, quite straightly, John Rhymes is not the Messiah of Deeping Baptist Church. And that's, that's nothing to do with John Rhymes. That's to do with any pastor or minister. Our minister is not the Messiah of Alexandra Road <laughs> Congregational Church. And um, the point is that they all look to another. They all look to another. John spoke about the unity that was in the church at Deeping. Um, and he also, I think he indicated, you know, that he didn't agree with absolutely everything, but they were looking to Christ and he was looking to Christ and he could very, very happily stand with them and work with them together in pushing forward the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ at that church. And I think that's just so encouraging for all churches, isn't it? All churches, including our own. You know, we look to another. We don't look to Chris or to myself or any of the other officers or maybe anybody else in the church. We look to our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, that's, that's what the Queen did. She pointed not to herself. She pointed to somebody else. And... You know, I think as we come to prayer, I'm going to pray for our nation. I'm going to pray for ourselves. I'm going to pray for our new king. But I'm going to pray not that he looks to the queen. A wonderful example, though, she has been. But that he looks to who she looked to, the Lord Jesus Christ. And who we, I trust, are all looking to and seeking to serve, and to follow. So let's come to the Lord now and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the time that we had yesterday, and we thank you for bringing uh, John and the Rhymes family together with the congregation at Deeping Baptist Church. And we do indeed pray 
for them. We pray for your strengthening of them. We pray for continued unity amongst them. We pray that you would continue to bind their hearts and lives together. We thank you for the evident joy that, uh, uh, that the church has in having the Rhymes family join them, but also the, the, the peace and the, the happiness that, that John and Linda uh, and, and Rachel and Susie and Tom uh, had at being there at Deeping. And we would pray that those bonds would be deepened and would continue to grow as they seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ together. Pray that for ourselves here at this church, Lord. I pray that we would be bound together more and more, Lord, and that we would look more and more to our God and to our King, uh, to uh, the King of the universe, not our King as in Charles, Lord, and that we would look to you and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, for all our help, for all our strength, for all our wisdom, for everything that we need, Lord, and that in doing so, we would be brought closer together as your people here, and that you would help us to serve you faithfully as a church. Lord, we pray for more workers in the vineyard. Lord, we see so many opportunities that you have given us here as a church, Lord, and we thank you and praise you for that. And if we need to work harder, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have the strength to work harder and to do more. But Lord, we recognize that not all of us are as young as we used to be, and I include myself in that. And so we ask that you would be gracious and send us workers for the vineyard. Lord, we thank you for the praying people in our church. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, those who are older in our church, we have a wonderful heritage of praying saints. And we thank you for that. And we pray that you would continue to help them to pray for the work of the church and to pray for everyone who is engaged in the work of the church here and that you would bless them and us in answering those prayers. Lord, and we do indeed pray for our nation. Lord, we pray for our King, uh, King Charles III. Lord, we pray that he would indeed take his Mother, as a, as a great example of how to rule, uh, things not to do and things to do. But Lord, we pray that he would look to Christ as she looked to Christ. That he would see that there is one who is far above all others. Lord, one who is far wiser, far more gracious, far more kind and long-suffering. Lord, we have read in Judges of your long-suffering, gracious dealings with your people. And Heavenly Father, we would pray that you would help Charles to reign whilst growing, increasing, showing more of yourself to him such that he may know you as his Lord and King. Lord, we pray for the funeral tomorrow. We pray for safety. We pray for the practical matters. We pray that everything uh, would go ahead as uh, planned and that there would be no incidents on difficulties. We would pray that our nation, at a time where death is at their forefront of their mind, that they would not just turn the page over and carry on as they have been come Tuesday morning. Lord, we would pray that those that have been affected in their hearts or have been caused to think about these things would seek the face of our God, of you, of the God that the Queen spoke of. Lord, we know that there are lots of words being said, but we would pray that the genuineness of the Queen's faith would be imprinted upon people's hearts and they would say, yes, she trusted in a God that she really believed in. Who is that God? And how can I know that God? Lord, we pray these things for our nation, for our town, for ourselves. And we pray that as we come into the week, the beginning of which on Monday, 
our monarch of 70 years will be buried. And as a new, as it were, chapter of history starts, we would pray that there would be a new, a new turning to our God, to you. Will we pray these things in the confidence and the knowledge that the Lord Jesus Christ's work on the cross allows us to come to you, knowing that you will hear our prayers. We ask you to answer them now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again before uh, Chris comes and preaches on that passage in Judges. So 358. Speak, Lord, in the stillness. Speak your word to me. Help me now to listen in expectancy. Let's sing this together as a prayer uh, as we come to hear God's word spoken to us. Thank you, Richard, for leading and for that report of yesterday's events. Uh, now, it's just a sermon, isn't it? And then we have communion. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Let's pray for a moment. Father in heaven, thank you for this beautiful evening. Thank you for sunshine. Thank you for one another. Thank you for this good place to meet. And thank you most of all for your word and for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We pray that he may be among us, strengthening all our hearts and minds and guiding and helping me with the words of my mouth as well. May they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're looking at Judges these days on Sunday night, so it might be helpful if, if you have a Bible to turn back to that. Or indeed, um, maybe Henry or James, could you find the reading slide? And uh, that's it. Yes, just leave that one there. Perfect. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Judges. <clears throat> and we've looked at the first two chapters and the beginning of chapter three, and I'd like now tonight to preach on the next part of chapter three, not the whole of the rest of it, the 
extremely gory and yet in a way very entertaining and thrilling account of Ehud, um, the left-handed man that will come next week, God willing. So come back next week. Most of you do come anyway, but we'll look at Ehud next week. Um, today we're going to look at Othniel, verses 7 through 11 of Judges chapter 3 that Richard read. Let me just find it in the various Bibles I've got here, and then I will start. So Judges 3, verses 7 to 11. And here we have, I believe, a very encouraging passage, a passage that will help us to hope in God and to believe in his presence in the work of the church and the work of the gospel, and indeed to hope and, and, and to pray to him for the greater working of his Holy Spirit. Because last week we looked at something of a pattern, didn't we, in the book of Judges, and, it, and, and something of a downward spiral, really, throughout the book of Judges, that uh, the children of Israel knew God's work through Moses and then through Joshua, but when Joshua died and when some other people who'd seen what God did in Joshua's days had died, when they saw that, they turned away from God and they turned to other gods. And then God, in his uh, desire to wake them out of their slumbers, but also in his anger against that idolatry, he allowed various other nations to come and oppress them. And time and again, chapter 2 says, things got really bad, and they called out to the Lord, and he would send a deliverer, and then the deliverer would help them, and for a while they would, after a fashion, follow God, and then that deliverer would die, and then they go down, they go astray again. And it seems to get gradually worse through the book of Judges. That's the pattern we saw, and I brought out one or two lessons from that last week. Well, what we've got here in Judges 3, verses 7 to 11, is that pattern with a little bit of meat, of flesh, on the bone. We get an example of how this happened. And the man who is the judge raised up as an example is Othniel. He's not on that slide. He's on the next slide, but that's okay. We get an example. And as far as we know, let me just talk a little bit about these few verses, and then I'll bring out the main message for us tonight from these verses. <clears throat> Uh, very likely this happened earlier in the, peri early in the period of Judges. Othniel, he is the first one recorded. Um, maybe it's happening in the 1320s or just soon before 1300 BC. The Judges period goes on probably from 1326 through to 10, uh, 1092 BC. And what's happened is that here at the beginning of this Judges period, Israel has largely forgotten about God. That's what we learn. Uh, they did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot him. The Lord Jehovah, their God, verse 7. It doesn't mean that they literally forgot him and just knew nothing about him, though after a while maybe some of their children knew almost nothing about him. But they didn't seek him. They didn't choose to remember him. They turned aside and went after other gods. Uh, and that was a terrible thing to do. And God, and they served the Baals and the Asherahs. And the anger of the Lord is against them. And that is no doubt partly God's justice and understandable and righteous outrage. But also, from what happens, it was a loving, jealous anger of God. They were, as it were, spiritually married to him. He had entered into a serious covenant relationship with Israel. He had done many wonderful things for them, and they had promised to be faithful to him. And now they are breaking that spiritual marriage, and he is jealous as it were for his spiritual wife. He is jealous like a human husband who has been faithful would be jealous if his wife he gathered or heard was just going off with another man. So the Lord's anger is against them. And after a while, he allows or he raises up, he, he, he enables these people um, uh, from... Uh, 
from, we gather, northwest Mesopotamia from a number of miles away to come, led by Kushan Rishathayim. Uh, yes, the king, the king of that part of Mesopotamia. He comes against them and oppresses them and is successful in warfare against Israel for eight years. That's what we're learning in the middle of the passage. God sells them into the hand of him. Kushan Rishathayim. Do you know what Kushan Rishathayim means? And unless I'd read books about it, I wouldn't know what Kushan Rishathayim meant. Rishathayim means double wickedness. Kushan of double wickedness. And most writers suggest that wasn't really his name. His name was Kushan, something that probably sounded a bit like double wickedness. It's probably a, a nickname in a way despising him that the writer of Judges has given. I mean, who is going to call their king, you know, Kushan of double, of double wickedness? The, the queen didn't name Charles, one of his middle names, you know, double, and then his third middle name, his second middle name, wickedness. You don't do that. Even the Victorians, who had some very bizarre names for their children, like Despair and other things like that, but he, or Jezebel and other such things, um, but even the Victorians didn't name their children, you know, double wickedness as their middle names, did they? As far as I'm aware. <laughs> you see? So this is a bit of biblical humor. This is the biblical writer led by the Spirit of God saying, this man is a truly terrible man, this man of Mesopotamia. He worshipped Baal and probably other gods as well. And, and he was an instrument in the hand of God, but that doesn't mean he was a good man. And we are calling his name in the Bible, Kushan of double wickedness. Dreadful fellow. But God uses him to punish and to, and to wake spiritually up Israel. That's what's going on in the middle of our passage. And eight years of it goes on. But then in verse 9, still on the screen there, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, then God heard and raised up somebody to deliver them from Kushan of double wickedness. Now notice, and I think I'm sure I pointed this out, something similar last week in Judges. Notice, it says they cried out to the Lord. And it just means they, they sort of yelled out. They, they cried out in their pain. It was really terrible being oppressed by Kushan of double wickedness. And they didn't like it. And after eight years of it, they were getting desperate. And after eight years of maybe trying the Baals and talking to the Baals and talking to Asherah, and talking to some of these false gods they turn to, after eight years of it, it's, they're getting nowhere and nothing's happening. And maybe there were prophets or priests or Levites who were also telling them to turn back to God. Well, it doesn't say they turn back to God and put away worshipping the Baals and stop worshipping the Baals. It doesn't say they repented and were really sorry for having forgotten the Lord, does it? And I don't think it implies it either at this point. It just says they cried out to the Lord. They got to a point where they thought, well, maybe Jehovah, who we have largely forgotten and who is not the main one we worship anymore, but maybe Jehovah can help us. And they called out to him and moaned to him and said, Lord, do something. Doesn't seem to be a wholehearted repentance. And yet then, God, in his mercy, even just with this tiny bit of remembering him, this tiny little crumb, if you like, of the beginning of repentance, at least remembering him and turning to him rather than just going on to the Baals and the Asherahs, God was merciful to them. He raised them up a deliverer. Isn't that extraordinary? Do you see the goodness and the mercy and the kindness of God at this point? I'm sure we are meant to see this in the text. And so he delivered them. He raised up this man, Othniel. Othniel was a good man. We've come across him a little bit in chapter 1, and he gets a mention in an earlier book of the Bible as well. And he was a good man, a little bit like Caleb, um, his older brother. Caleb was a man of faith who trusted God to fulfill his promises. And we get the impression in the previous passage that Othniel was also a man of faith. A man who believed that the true God, the God who'd revealed himself to Abraham, Jehovah, this God, that he was the living God and a gracious God and a powerful God, man of faith. And God uses Othniel. And at a certain point, presumably in the after eight years or in the eighth or ninth year, the Spirit of God comes on Othniel. 
And it seems he comes on Othniel in power. And Othniel is suddenly able not only to look after his own family and his own maybe servants and his own flocks and his own buildings and his own business, he is able to lead others in warfare. He is filled with vitality and wisdom and military prowess and people pay attention to him and people follow him and he's able to get a proper army together and he is able to go and smash Cushan of double wickedness. And that's what happened. He prevails, he wins. God gives him a great victory. And the end is, of this time, is that for 40 years, they've been oppressed by Cushan for eight years, but for 40 years, they, the land has rest. That is, these people didn't cause them any more trouble. And throughout much of Israel, they had substantial peace and rest, and they were able to flourish, and they enjoyed the goodness of God in the land that God had brought them to. And then after 40 years or so, Othniel dies. And then, and then it says, and the next bit says, which Richard did read, um, the next bit says, and then they forgot God again. And what that interestingly implies is this, that during the time of Othniel, after God had, the Spirit had come on Othniel, and he had been successful against Cushan of double wickedness from Mesopotamia, that for a time, maybe for many of those 40 years, actually, to quite some extent, not just Othniel, but the people of Israel generally turned back. To some extent, they turned back to God. That's the implication. But then when Othniel died, whoop, back to the Baals. You see, there was a partial repentance. There was a partial spiritual revival, it would appear. A partial putting away of idolatry for those 40 years. As a, Israel's response to God's kindness, you see, God's kindness through Othniel led them to some measure of repentance, but it only lasted for those 40 years. And he's called somewhere in there, a judge, isn't he? Yes, there we are. Um, uh, a deliverer, it says in verse 9 in our translation, and then it says he judged Israel. This is the word used for these men, judges, and the book is called the book of judges, and understandably so. But when you look at how the word judge and judge the verb as well, the judging is going on in the book of judges, it seems that they were, they were people who did settle cases. They were like what we might call a judge. They did a certain amount of judging and sorting out of applying the Mosaic law to people's lives and to the community. But they also seem to have been people who were expected and to some extent did who taught the people about God. They were sort of spiritual leaders as well. And then when the Spirit came on them, they were military leaders. So they were as much leaders and deliverers as judges in the narrow sense of the word. Their work was a wider work than just what we call judging. And so many English translations call them judges and then have footnotes saying, well, it's wider than that. Deliverers, leaders, etc., etc., is the sort of thing that is said, leader or judge, that kind of thing. That's who he was, and that is what he did in the goodness of God. So that's the situation. That's the passage. So what is the lesson I draw from it? Well, <clears throat> there's lots of lessons we could draw, but let me draw this one in particular. I'd like to notice from this passage the way in which, for eight years, the people of God were at a low ebb, and indeed were oppressed by these people from Mesopotamia. But then, in his mercy, God raised up this deliverer, and they then had 40 years of peace and rest, and we would gather some measure, at least, of flourishing in the land that God had given them. And, I'd, and I also assume that God's dealings with his people these days, in New Testament days, after the cross of Jesus and his resurrection and the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost, that God's dealings with his church now are every bit as gracious, if not more gracious. And so I draw this lesson, that God does give his church and his people periods of rest and refreshment and flourishing. God gives his people, not only in Old Testament days, but in New Testament days, in our days, and until the Lord Jesus returns, God gives his church and people periods of rest, refreshment, and flourishing. That is the central thing I want to draw from this, and I want to see, explain a little bit what I mean by that. I want to explain why this is the case and point out two or three things we see from 
this bit of judges that help us to know this is true. So, first of all, what does this mean? <clears throat> what do I mean? What am I talking about? I'm talking about this, that the God gives the church from time to time, not all the time, not all churches everywhere throughout the world from the first century until Jesus comes back. It's not a, there are ups and downs, but as well as downs, there are ups. There are periods of relative rest and refreshment and flourishing for Christians and indeed for churches in the whole of the gospel era. Um, the New Testament talks about there being terrible or perilous times. It talks about perilous or terrible times, difficult times. Right at the beginning of 2 Timothy chapter 3, in the last days, there will be perilous or difficult times. That indeed is so. But what I'm saying tonight is that not all times are difficult and perilous times. And that God, very often, after a difficult or a, a very difficult or a somewhat difficult and somewhat perilous time, the Lord will then change his dealings with the church across a whole area or across a whole country or a whole continent or sometimes even the world. After a difficult or perilous time, God will often then bring in a time that is more a time of refreshing and of flourishing and, and, uh, and, of, and of peace for his church and that this is true for us. We should live in this kind of understanding of history. So let me, uh, I'm not going to go into a detailed history lesson, but reflecting on this, it would seem that you might say, well, okay, so where are we at the moment, Chris? Are we in a flourishing time? And we're in a sort of peaceful time, and yet the church is not very big, and churches don't find gospel work very easily. So where are, where are we at the moment, and what are you expecting us to look forward to? Right? Good question. If you're paying attention, you're asking that sort of question. Good. So I would just put it this way. Very broad brush. This is very broad brush. It needs to be. But I would say that from about the 1790s, right? I'm going for back a fair way. 1790s. I'm not going back to the Reformation. I could, but that would take too long. But from the, the very late 18th century, from the, the very end of John Wesley's life, when John Wesley and many others had gone around on horseback telling loads of people about Jesus, but they had a difficult time. Sometimes, you know, not just tomatoes, but stones were thrown at them sometimes. They, some of them died, not many, some died. Some nearly died. It was pretty tough telling. Although we read these amazing stories in some revival books about the early Methodists and George Whitfield went here and Charles Wesley and John Wesley and, and these other characters, lots of them in Wales as well, you know, and... and um, uh, the man up in uh, Grimshaw, William Grimshaw up in Yorkshire, people doing great things, but they had it tough. And, and it wasn't happening everywhere in England for those days. But by the end of the 18th century, by about the 1790s, a lot of people started getting converted. And in the 1790s and right through the 19th century, an awful lot of people in England and in Wales and in Scotland and uh, in parts of Ireland as well, an awful lot of people came to evangelical faith. In the middle of the 19th century, the politicians talked about the, the non-conformist vote. The Whig Party, which became in the end the Liberal Party, that party in Parliament was very largely the political party voted for by non-conformist, Bible-believing, and very, very often born-again Christians. They were a massive force in the land. When there was some disaster in the, in the British Empire, love it or loathe it or both, um, but there was a disaster. I think it was the Indian Mutiny, if I remember correctly, in the late 19th century. The person charged to preach, to lead the nation's mourning about what was going on in Egypt, was not, in Egypt, in India, was none other than Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was a red hot Bible preaching, Jesus exalting preacher. And he preached to thousands of people on that occasion. You see, those were days of comparative glory and refreshing for the Christian church. And in those days, Britain was sending missionaries all over the world. Certainly to the Indian subcontinent and in the end to China and right throughout Africa, people were going from this country and glorious things were happening. It wasn't the second coming. It wasn't perfect by any means. There were, all, there were hypocrisies. There were all kinds of bad things mixed in. But it was a period of the, the ascendancy and the success in many, many ways of the Christian faith in this land and in some other lands as well. Of course, it wasn't only Britain. 
but it was, it was certainly Britain uh, as well in those days. And I would suggest to you that things have gradually been crumbling and falling apart ever since. <laughs> in the later 19th century, there was a bit of rot came into the pulpits and some of the preachers started not believing everything and, and going off the boil. Um, but still people came to church. And even in the, in the, 20, the early 20th century, many, many people went to church. In the years just before the First World War, huge percentage in the Edwardian era, huge percentage of the English population went to church then. It was still kind of going strong, but it was gradually running down and running out of steam slowly but slowly but still you would say they weren't difficult times i mean they were a bit disappointing for the people who remembered the 1890s or something but still christianity was a force in the land the mesopotamians hadn't taken over i would suggest even in in 1930 but then come the 60s and a bit of a, a revolution in outlook and so on and then you get into the 1970s and it would seem to me that it was by about the 90 the late 1970s 1980 or so that you could say that things were really changing for the gospel cause. I was converted in 1971. Um, my school was unusual, but in my school in Newcastle on Tyne, about 900 boys, there were roughly 200 boys in the Bible-believing Evangelical Christian Union. Every week in the school, on school premises, led by one of the teachers, there were about 200 boys singing Christian songs and hearing about Jesus. And lots of us were going off to house parties for more intense stuff in the school holidays. And we were sometimes going, having contacts with other schools to see if we could have revivals in their schools. And then the teacher who led our Christian union hired the city hall in Newcastle and would jam it packed full of young people and teenagers from all over Newcastle. That was happening in the, in the early 70s. Um, and... Indeed, similar things. At Cambridge University in those days, about 10% or more of the undergraduate student body in those days in the mid-70s were in the Christian Union. On a Saturday night, when students usually like to go around and socialize and do a variety of things, good and not so good, um, the Christian Union in Cambridge in the mid-1970s hired, every Saturday during term, they hired the Cambridge Student Union Building. That's where the union is and where, you know, all the posh people have debates and learn how to be politicians and all that jazz. They didn't, they, they never used it on a Saturday night because six to 700 people, students of the Christian Union were in there every Saturday night listening to the Bible. Extraordinary. That doesn't, that's not happening now. Not in England, that, not in Britain, that isn't. You see? We're in different days. Things have changed. And I would suggest that somewhere around the late 70s, the 80s, if you like, that period of flourishing, which had been at its height in the mid-19th century, it gradually went... Right? That's what happened. And that things have changed. And that really, since maybe somewhere around about the... Um, somewhere round about the, uh, the late 70s, the early 80s. It's changed. And I would say that we're not out of that period of flourishing in this country, and now we are in mildly, not wildly, no, 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 not very. I would suggest that we are now in mildly difficult times for the gospel, where we're not being persecuted. People from some countries would say, it's marvelous, you know, there are churches all over the place and the government doesn't pull them down and, and you know, and if they're firebombed by yobs and the police do something, you're, you're in a wonderful situation. But in terms of the, the, the cultural forces and the prejudices against the Christian faith and the difficulty of seeing at least, at least ethnically English or British people converted, we're in more, much more difficult times. But I would just say it's mildly. We're in mildly difficult times. And yet even so, what's remarkable is this, that even despite the fact that we have entered, I think, in recent decades, somewhat mildly difficult times in this country, clearly God hasn't given up on the country, not altogether. Here we have the handover, as I've been saying the last couple of Sundays. We've had the handover from one monarch to another monarch. And the words associated with that handover of the monarchy are just almost as Christian as the words 70 years ago. 
and partly, no doubt, because our late dear Queen Elizabeth II was a Christian, and I don't expect she would let them change the words. And they don't change the words of the next king and of the, and of the various events, and certainly tomorrow's event, and probably not the coronation in a few months' time. They don't change the words now for Charles, partly out of respect to her. It would just be total disrespect, wouldn't it? If they said rude things about Christianity or the Christianity of the British monarch, the monarchy at the moment, it, that, that would be completely unacceptable in the good providence of God. So God hasn't finished with us, I'm suggesting. And yet we are in somewhat difficult or perilous times spiritually compared to what we were in from 1790 to about 1980 or 1985. So that's what I mean. And what I'm saying partly is this, that we should not be saying, oh, well, it's all going to get worse from now on. You know, the end times are coming, and in the end times, everything just gets worse and worse. No, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible instead talks about times of refreshing from the presence of God and difficult times, and they tend to alternate. And, and that's what's happened in British history in the past. Before 1790, it was pretty grim. From about 1700 through to 1790, even though a few preachers started going around and, and having real power from about 1735-40 onwards, but in the early 1700s, it was pretty grim. Right? And yet God changed it. And changed it very significantly right through the 19th century. But now it's got a bit grim again. So how do you and I know? We, we shouldn't be just assuming it's going to get grimmer and grimmer and grimmer. It might do, but we shouldn't be assuming that. Because God is the God of Othniel. God is the God who is pleased from time to time to say to an enemy of the gospel, you've had, you've had enough. You've got too big for your boots you enemy, and now for the, out of love for my people and out of a desire that more people in that country should be converted and, and because I want to show my justice and my anger at you, you very, very proud enemy of mine, I'm going to bring you down. And that's what he did with Cushan. And for quite a long time, from 1790, and actually before 1790, probably the greatest enemy in this country has been secular humanism. And the idea that there is no God above, and that the God of the Bible isn't real, and the God of the Bible didn't create the universe, and the God of the Bible didn't and couldn't raise Jesus from the dead, and therefore the Bible is a myth and a fable, and these Christians are deluded, secular humanistic philosophy. But I'm saying to you now, I'm wondering whether, and I certainly think we should be praying about this and thinking this might be so. I'm not saying it dogmatically. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. Of that. I'm not claiming to be a prophet of that kind. But I'm saying, should we not be praying and hoping that that secular humanism in Britain is like Cushan of, of double wickedness and that the time is coming soon when God will bring him down? His time will come. Marxist-Leninism, what happened in the Russian Revolution in, in October 1917, and what dominated much of Eastern Europe for 60, 70, 80 years, in the end, I know we've got other problems in Eastern Europe at the moment, but that Marxist-Leninism, God brought crashing down in 1989, didn't he? He didn't allow it to continue in that form forever. And for quite a number of years, and in some countries to this time, Eastern Europe and even parts of what was Russia and the USSR have a religious freedom they didn't have before. God brought that, God brought that enemy crashing down, I'm, I'm sure, in answer to many Christians' prayers. And should we not be praying? Praying with some hope that God will bring secular humanism in British and Western culture crashing down and bring a time of new opportunity, new openness, and new peace, and new, a new spiritual flourishing to the churches of this land and further afield. I suggest to you, we should be hoping for that and praying for that. So that's what I'm talking about. That's my thesis today. That God brings to his church and people times, periods of rest, refreshment, and flourishing. Secondly, am I right to think we can read from the book of Judges to the Christian church? And yes, we can, because they were the people of God in their day, and we 
Christians who believe in Jesus Messiah, we are the people of God today. There is a direct line. They were preparing the way for the coming of Messiah, and we are believing and functioning in the light and in the aftermath of the coming of Messiah. There is a direct line from the people in Judges to us through Jesus. So yes, we can, and we are right to do so. And the New Testament does that kind of thing time and again. So yes, we can draw these kind of lessons. And let me just go on now to two or three, briefly to two or three aspects of the Othniel story that we can particularly rely on in our day. To think that, yes, indeed, God can bring flourishing out of a somewhat lack of flourishing. God can do this in his mercy. Think of the mercy of God. That The mercy of God, the undeserved love of God is one reason we can hope for this. We might say, well, we've been unfaithful and we haven't evangelized enough and we're not prayerful enough and we don't love God as much as our forefathers and I remember my grandfather was like this and that preacher was like that. And Yes, indeed, and we can look back, sometimes with rose-tinted spectacles, but we can look back and remember days of old and we can read books about William Grimshaw or George Whitfield and think we're not as godly as that, so nothing can happen around here. But that is to believe in work salvation. These people in Israel in about 1300 BC, they were not particularly godly. They were just hurting. But instead of simply turning their hurt to false gods or to money or to booze or something else to try and relieve their hurt, they eventually, to some extent, remembered God and turned back to him and cried out to him. But not with, not with wonderful repentance. They just cried out. And God, in mercy, undeserved love, heard them and raised up a leader who delivered them from the enemy. So we can pray along those lines. Lord, we don't deserve it. No, in all kinds of ways, we're probably half hypocritical. And we don't love each other enough. And, you know, we're just Stoics rather than Christians half the time, etc., etc. But Lord... We're hurting because we do want your name to be exalted, and yet nobody seems to want to believe in you, apart from the people who already believe in you. Lord, this concerns us. And bring it to God in prayer, on your own and together, and believe that in mercy, God will hear. Mercy. That's one thing we surely should and can learn from this passage. Mercy. And here's another thing, the power of God's spirit. God can do this in his mercy. God can do this, and we should be hoping that he'll do it and working and praying for him to do it. God can do this in his power. You might say, oh, well, the forces, you know, there's the internet and there's the BBC and their philosophy and there's all these clever secular humanists and there's a whole of global academic science and, you know, there's now the psychologizing of everything and there's postmodernism and there's the, the if it feels good, do it attitude and all this other stuff. And now everyone's muddled about their identity and thinks that their identity is governed just by how they feel about themselves. So how in the midst of all that, you know, non-Christian stuff. Can God possibly do anything like what you are suggesting, Chris? It's a far more difficult situation even than when you were in your school Christian union in 1972. How can God do it? And I say to you, don't you believe in the Holy Spirit? It will, it will have looked pretty grim during those eight years when the Mesopotamians were ruling over part of Israel for them to be crying out to God, and yet God sent his spirit upon Othniel, and the Holy Spirit through Othniel was more powerful than the enemy. And God is more powerful than all these subtle ideological forces in our culture today. And it is simply a form of atheism, if you like, to say that God can't do anything today. It's got too big, it's got too complicated. No, God's spirit is able to do things. Uh, things we can't even imagine, things that are beyond our envisaging. Um, the Spirit of God was at work in Old Testament days from time to time, yes, mightily, in someone like Othniel. But what you often know, what you do notice in the Old Testament is that when the Spirit of God comes on the people of God in the Old Testament, he doesn't come on the whole body of the people of God, he just comes on one man, Othniel this time. And the other judges later, most, most of them or all of them, are described in this sort of way. But what sensible biblical writers point out um, is that the Spirit of God then was coming on an individual from time to time. Um, 
For what purpose? Well, in order that Israel might simply be preserved. And in order that, that one day the, the, the chosen seed, the long-awaited seed, Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, so that Israel would at least be preserved and the, what we call the Old Testament would be preserved and so that they, Israel would be preserved so that the Messiah, the seed of Abraham, could be born. So in a way, it was a sort of uh, a preserving operation. It was just keeping things going, but it wasn't an expansive operation. It was just keeping the show on the road enough that the seed would arrive. But once Jesus had come and risen from the dead, and on the day of Pentecost had poured out his spirit on the church, then you know, the spirit is far more abundantly at work. We're in days of the greater and wider work of the Holy Spirit. And that is what's happening. And that's why today, as far as we can tell, there are hundreds of millions of born-again Christians across the world. From just 120 frightened people who had the doors locked, you know, before the day of Pentecost. Uh, you know, frightened 120 has turned into hundreds of millions. That's because of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, not just coming on, coming on the odd person, on the odd Christian leader or the odd preacher or the odd evangelist like Billy Graham or somebody. No, the Spirit of God comes on whole churches or whole groups of Christians. He comes on the body of Christ. Yes, you know, sometimes one believer is more filled with the Spirit than another. But every believer, whatever their gifts and whatever their role in things, every believer can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what we should be looking for. And this is what God has done many, many times in the past, over the last 2,000 years. Uh, the writer B.B. Warfield puts it this way. The, the object of the whole dispensation in Old Testament ways, days was just to prepare for the outpouring of the Spirit later on all flesh. He kept, the Spirit kept the remnant safe and pure in Israel. But now, he says, now it's like a stream, a stream that, uh, to use a figure of Isaiah, as Warfield says, the, the church in those days, the people of God in the Old Testament, was then like a pent-in stream, a stream that had banks keeping it in. It is now like that pent-in stream, but with the barriers broken down and the Spirit of the Lord driving the stream. In a word, he says, that was a day in the Old Testament in which the Holy Spirit restrained his power, and now the great day or time of the Spirit has come. So we should be expecting the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in and through ordinary believers. And not only people who preach from pulpits or have gifts of evangelism, but we should be praying and looking for the Holy Spirit in and through ordinary believers. Uh, more than in the days of Othniel, because we're in the days of the, the gospel era and the days of the global growth of the church and the days of the Holy Spirit in a way that they were not then. So far from saying we can't expect the Spirit to work as in he did in and through Othniel, we should say, no, we're at times when that is far more to be expected according to the Scripture. You see? So that's, again, something we can learn from Othniel's experience. We can say, yes, and now in our day, we can expect this more, not less. And one other thing from the passage, and then I'll uh, apply one or two things. But from the passage, final point <clears throat> is that God does these things and we can look to him to do them, not only in his mercy and not only in his power by the Holy Spirit. We can look to him to do things... Um, because it's appropriate, and I mentioned this briefly, it's appropriate, it was appropriate for Kushan of double wickedness after a while to be brought down. He got too big for his boots. And that's what God does time and again in Old Testament days. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and others who get proud and God uses them for a time to chasten or to cause trouble to his people and then they get far, far, far too proud and after a while God brings them crashing down. And that's what we should be looking for God to do in our days. We should be saying, Lord, this secular humanism that has so tainted people's attitudes towards the Christian faith, well, you have kept 
Christianity alive in Britain, although in a somewhat enfeebled state. And you have even kept some Christianity alive in the higher centers of power and in the monarchy and to some extent in the houses of parliament as well, uh, etc. You have kept some Christianity there and now they can't even get rid of it uh, when they're looking forward to uh, the coronation of a new king. They, they haven't managed to get rid of it. Lord, have mercy and bring the enemies of your truth crashing down. Not that we want their personal destruction, but we want the destruction of their philosophy. Yes, we should love secular humanists and pray for them and show them kindness and, and seek to entice them into believing in Jesus who can forgive all their sins. Absolutely, of course, we shouldn't be against them and wanting to kill them. No, I know that things have changed from Old Testament to New Testament in that regard. But in terms of the thing, secular humanism and any philosophy or religion that does not lead people to Jesus Christ, we want it to be brought crashing down. That doesn't mean we don't want people to be free to practice their religion. It seems to me that New Testament Christianity is in favor of full religious freedom within the bounds of a sensible constitution and law and order. We should be certainly advocates for religious liberty, but we should be praying and working for these false philosophies and particularly this secular humanism to be brought crashing down and say to God, is it not time, O Lord, for you to call time on this dreadful poison? And to hope that in our day, he might do so. In small ways, next week, when secular humanists are converted in this and other churches, and in a wide way, maybe within our lifetime. That's what we should be praying for, looking for, and hoping for. So as he concludes, be encouraged. Be encouraged. We are still here in this country. We have religious freedom to a very, very large extent, far more than many countries. And, and, Indeed, in these days and tomorrow morning, the country is even hearing quite a bit about the Christian faith and the triumph of Jesus Christ over death. Let us hope that in this era of the Spirit, God will work afresh among us and through us and among and through many, many other Christians across the land. Let us be encouraged. Let us pray for our King as we have been doing. Let's carry on doing so. And let us in our daily lives, as well as our church life, let us not be ashamed of our faith in Jesus Christ. Let your faith in Jesus come out naturally. Don't be ashamed. Don't be cowed. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your colleagues. Pray for the people you are acquainted with or that you bump into day by day. And pray for the Holy Spirit to work in their hearts and to use you as a witness to use you as a friend and a kind friend and a godly friend and pray for the work of the church as well. God help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to trust in you and to know that you are well able to revive things as you did in the days of Othniel. And so we pray that you will have mercy on us and you'll quicken our faith and you'll grant us more and more naturally to let our faith be known in good ways and you will use our tongues and our lips and you'll use our church and all we do here as well to spread the good news of Jesus further afield and we pray that you will bring crashing down these dreadful lies of atheism and secularism and all these various philosophies that attack the Bible and what it says. Bring them down we pray and show people that these other roots and these other ways of trying to be happy and sort human life out and sort the country out simply don't work. Have mercy, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a song, and then we'll have a short gap before communion. So our song ah, is not in the books, but it'll be on the screen. Grace, unmeasured, vast, and free. We've been thinking about God's mercy and this um, one will help us. And I think, yeah, is it up there? Yes, it is. Great. Thank you. Let's stand.
And now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We'll have a two-minute pause and then take the Lord's Supper. <clears> Thank <throat> you.